It's great to be here. Let's start this way. Carl Van Clausewitz. He said this, the first, the supreme, the most far-reaching act of judgment that a commander and general must make is to determine the type of war upon which one is embarking, neither mistaking it for nor turning it into something alien to its nature. What did he mean by that? Well, the first thing he meant by that, if we can get this to advance, is we got to do a better job of enhancing human cognition. How do we do that? We do that through this thing that we've been talking about a lot here, and it's called critical thinking. My research and the people that I've talked to for many years have used this term a lot. But I also know that a lot of people simply don't understand some of the complexities of that term. What does it mean? Why is it important to the profession of arms? Something we probably can do a lot better of, better at, is determining what this is and how it affects us. Because here's something we know to be true. Everything we do here with our hands has a common starting place. It's right here in our brains. Everything we do starts with a decision. It starts with an adjudication of information. It starts with trying to cope and understand these things we bring in through our senses so that we can then make a decision. It's that process that determines exactly what it is that we do here with our hands. So if we want to do a better job of shaping what we do, and this matters whether we're at home raising children, whether we're trying to develop a healthy relationship with our spouse, or whether we're trying to develop an environment of thinking at work among, among the airmen, or among DOD for that matter, all of the same thing applies. What we do here is a result of something that's going on here. Perhaps the most important thing that I can share with you that's really a human axiom is this. We can trust that people will do what they perceive is in their best interest to do. That's very powerful. Henry Kissinger was asked here recently uh, whether or not we could trust the Russians. This is what he said. He said, we can trust the Russians to do what they perceive is in their best interest to do. If we begin to understand why people make the decisions they make, that goes a long way in understanding why they do what they do. So if we want to shape what people do, whether it's internally for our own health or externally in war, we need to start at the source of that behavior, and that is with the human brain, human cognition. Voltaire was right. He spotted this. We can't withstand the assault of critical thinking. We're not going to lose the next war from the neck down. We'll lose the next war from the neck up. This is where it starts. What we do and how we do it will be won or lost in our intellectual capacity. Our ability to understand and critically think through the complexities. So what do all these people have in common? This is a diverse group, right? Very diverse group. Some, some of them are living, some of them are dead. All nationalities, genders. All of these people have a common denominator. They're critical thinkers. Critical thinking isn't just something that applies to the US military. It applies to the human phenomenon. It applies across the board of all the decisions we make, at home and at work. And the idea is, is that if we can better understand how that process takes place, then hopefully the decisions we make from that intellectual process will be better simply than if we didn't do that. And that's the process that we're looking at. Take a minute to read this. Basically, the most important takeaway from this is there's a lot of things we can be in our profession. But one of the things we can't be is suckers. This requires tough habits of thought. We have to be able to systematically look at the information we have before us. And we have to be able to take in and understand that information through something that's called intellectual synthesis. Think about it this way. In the back of our brains, there's these five-gallon buckets. And those five-gallon buckets are filled with our experiences, with what we've learned, maybe with our education, both good and bad. And what happens is we see things that happen in the world around us, these experiences, and we see them, we hear them, we feel them. We take that information in, and our brain goes back into those buckets, and it says, well, it's kind of like this. I've seen that before, and it's kind of like this. I've seen that before. And it takes these experiences and this education, and it synthesizes that, intellectual synthesis, into some type of a road map that allows our brain to understand and cope with the information we're taking in. That particular process is very reliant on previous experience. And there's some theory that we can talk about that goes into that. The reason why this is so important to understand is simply because we live in a very 
complex world. We've always lived in a complex world. The human phenomenon is, in fact, a complex phenomenon. But perhaps the most important thing to understand is this last one. We know this to be pretty true. For the most part, poor thinking results normally in poor decisions. And poor decisions often result in poor outcomes, poor results, right? It reminds me of uh, a young man who went to visit his grandmother years ago. And he was sitting down with her visiting. And there on the table was a, a bowl of peanuts. And he reached down. He grabbed these peanuts while he was visiting with his grandmother. He threw a few in his mouth. And he immediately realized these are grandma peanuts, right? No salt little stale. But he sits and visits with her for about an hour, and after the hour, it's time to get up and leave, and he looks down and he realizes that he has eaten this entire bowl of peanuts. He looks at his grandmother, he says, Grandma, I'm sorry, I've eaten your entire bowl of peanuts. It was so rude of me. She says, that's okay, Sonny. Ever since I lost my teeth, all I do is suck the chocolate off of them. <laughs> Here's the point. Better information likely results in better decisions. So that's kind of a funny joke, but you know, how many times do we make decisions in the profession of arms and we don't have all the information? All we have is that information that we feel good about, that information that was pulled back from that intellectual synthesis of those buckets of our own experience or our own education. And we believe that the solution set lies solely in the things that we bring to the fight. In large measure, that's what results in personal bias. So here's some theory that we can just look at real quick. The theory of determinism, if we look at the far right, basically says this. There are certain things within the human experience that we can know to be true. As a matter of fact, one of the unique things to Homo sapiens is this idea that we pass knowledge on from one generation to the next. As we build these green blocks of knowledge, if you will, we're able to do very powerful things with them because we get more green blocks. These things that have de been determined to be axioms, human axioms, they can be very powerful. In fact, I can predict the future given my green blocks. Knowing the things that I know about physics, I can tell you where Venus will be in the sky this time next week. That's very powerful. But we also know there's this other theory, and that's the theory of uncertainty. And we also know that the theory of uncertainty says there's probably an infinite number of things that we simply don't know and possibly can't know. There are a lot of things that our green blocks just simply don't describe. We can give a pill in medicine to somebody and it saves their life and the same pill kills somebody else. This uncertainty in the human phenomenon is very important. It's important for us to understand it. In the 1700s, there was a mathematician and a philosopher named Laplace. Some of you engineers may remember Laplace transformations, hopefully in a good way. Laplace basically had a friend who came to him and said, uh, I'm a gambler. I'm rolling dice, and I'm losing a lot of money. Can you help me out? I know you're a numbers guy. So this is what he did. He, Using the theory of determinism, he wrote down all the different ways you could roll two true die, a two, a three. He realized there was only one way to roll a two or a three, but there were multiple ways to roll an eight, six and a two, four and a four, five and a three. Those were things he could determine, things that he was comfortable saying he could know. But then he also took into account that there's a level of uncertainty in this process, right? That uncertainty is when I roll those die, I don't know what's going to come up. But this is what he determined. If I take into account the things I know to be true, those things that I have learned from, and then I get out of the comfort zone of my green blocks long enough to understand that there are uncertainties, things I don't know, things that maybe somebody else knows if I ask the right questions, then just that act alone will give us the third theory, the theory that Laplace is famous for, and that's the theory of probability. The theory of probability basically tells me there are certain things that I can know to be true, if I stop long enough to get out of those green blocks, I can get into an arena of those areas that I have uncertainty in, and just that process alone will increase the probability that the decisions I make, regardless of what the issue may be, will be better than if I just depended on my own green blocks alone. That's the theoretical piece. So what's the definition? We hear a lot of definitions about critical thinking, but the most important element in this definition is that it takes into account complexities normally not considered. We want to try to better anticipate second and third order effects. There's a lot of misnomer on this. A lot of people misunderstand second and third order effects as unintended consequences, and that's simply not the case. And if it is, we've done something wrong. Strategists, for example, should engineer second and third order effects. 
If they're not anticipated second and third order effects, then they're normally unintended consequences. We often talk about the second and third order effects of a policy that the policy makers didn't understand or the, the war plan that resulted in something that we didn't anticipate. That's an unintended, unintended consequence. But it should never be a second or third order effect that was unanticipated. It's critical thinking that gets us to the point where we not only understand second and third order effects of our decisions, but we engineer second and third order effects. That's what critical thinking does for us. And you can see why that's so important in the profession of arms, in a complex world. Now, the single most destructive aspect in this is our own personal bias. I've given this material to thousands, tens of thousands of people. And it really comes down to the same thing almost every time. Our own personal bias. We keep tripping over our own green blocks. That's what happens. We're so comfortable in this that we build lounge chairs out of our green blocks. We build big green walls of determinants, things that we're comfortable with. In the military, we call that walls of dogma. And we build that wall specifically so we don't have to look over there at the messy world of uncertainty. When in reality, where do the second and third order effects and the unintended consequences come from? Over here. This is where they live. This is where they're born. This is where they're fed. So what do we have to do? We have to get out of our own bias. We've got to get out of the comfort zone of our green blocks. Take from that what we can, but then we have to find out where some other green blocks are that we don't have. We've got to get out of this process and we've got to realize that if we take what we know with what we don't know, seek out others who know more than we know, we will do what? We'll increase the probability that the decisions we make within that issue will be better than if we don't do that. Pretty straightforward. Here's an example. Everybody's seen this illusion before. In this particular example, the circle on the left appears to be bigger than the circle on the right. The more interesting question is, why is that? Well, quite simply, it's based on the things that surround the circle. It gives us a misperception. Both of those circles are the same size, but because this is surrounded by different size circles on the outside than that, it gives us a misperception. Well, this is the same thing that happens in regards to the fact that I surround myself by the people and I substantiate the way I think by certain news articles, by certain blogs. These are the things that define my perspective. And that's going to give me a perspective. But that's not necessarily the things that our enemy, or our partners for that matter, surround themselves by. So in this case, both people have a misperception based on what they surround themselves by. This idea of personal bias, and it being the single most destructive roadblock to critical thinking, is essential if we want to be critical thinkers. We have to get beyond that in what we do on a daily basis. How do we do that? It requires tough habits of thought. It requires getting up in the morning and saying, today, I'm going to systematically begin to look at the way the world revolves around me, and I'm going to think about it differently. Here's some examples of systematic thinking. Systematic thinking tells me there's a temporal degree to my thinking. It's not just about deciding A. Often I have to decide B and C and D, and it matters what order that thinking comes in. It's temporal, right? So in the first case, if I want to land an airplane, there's two things I need to do. I need to put the gear down and I need to flare. One needs to come before the other, right? In the second picture, the medical community, I would hope that the anesthesiologist does his job and makes his decision before the surgeon does his. Temporal thinking, the same as in chess. Thinking in time, if you will, any of the services. So here's an example. Everybody in this room, I want you to systematically think through something. Keep it to yourself. Pick a number between 1 and 10. Just keep it to yourself. Multiply that number by 9. Got it? Now, whatever number you have in your head, add those two digits together to get a single number. Add the two digits together to get a single number. Now subtract five from that. You should have another number now. Take that number and associate it with the corresponding letter in the alphabet. So if your number is three, your letter would be A, B, C. Got it? Now with that letter, think of any country that starts with that letter. Got it? Now take the last letter in that country's name and think of any animal that starts with that letter. Now think of the country that that animal most predominantly comes from. Now raise your hand if you're thinking of a kangaroo from Australia that started in Denmark. 
That's an example, folks, of systematic thinking. I didn't get in your head, but I knew psychologically what the human brain was capable of thinking. If I can systematically engineer second and third order effects such that what happens at the end of that process, I can better anticipate there's power in that. That's what critical thinking does for us. But it doesn't always work that way. Everybody put your hands out in front of you like this. Everybody watching on video can do this as well. Palms facing each other. Now rotate your hands inward like this to where your palms are down, your thumbs are facing each other. Now keep rotating so that your palms are away from each other and your thumbs are down. Take your right hand, put it over the top of your left hand. Pretty simple, right? All the, get those arms all the way across, okay? All the way, exactly. Right hand over the top of the left hand. Now put them together like this. Got it? Now go like this. It was simple enough. How come we didn't get to the same end state? Here's the point. Systematic thinking works, but we have to be very shrewd in this process. We have to be very careful that the decisions we make moving from A to B to C to D, that we aren't somehow myopic in our own bias, our own green blocks. And when we get to an area where A to B to C to D does not necessarily match the green blocks that somebody else has, we're probably going to result in an end state that's different than we want it to be. That normally ends up in unintended consequences or second and third order effects that were not anticipated. What most people do when they start talking about dealing with prejudice is they just rearrange their own green blocks. They're not really getting out of what they think and what they perceive because they see many of these green blocks as made out of titanium and they polish them on a regular basis, right? But in our profession, in developing human cognition, we need to understand that that's very limited very limiting to the human brain. We have to get out of that environment and we have to be very comfortable in the world of ambiguity. And that process alone, taking that three foot step from what we know to what we don't know, will increase the probability that the decisions we make will be better than if we don't do this. Now notice I didn't say it's gonna guarantee they'll be better, but I will tell you from a probabilistic perspective, they will likely be better. And I think that's a very important characteristic. Now, there's a lot of information that goes into this. There's a web page you can go to. You can get this information, download it, use it, or lose it. This is a three-week course. It's been reduced down into three days, down into one day, down into four hours, down into 20 minutes. So if you want more information, you can go here and you can get this. The, the, the takeaway from this, folks, is this is something that requires tough habits of thought. It doesn't just happen. We have to teach people. We have to engineer this. This has to be something that people understand what this process of going from the known to the unknown is if we truly want to increase the probability that the outcome we have is anticipated. That's what critical thinking does for us.